Welcome to the Going North Podcast, where we will deliver you tips and techniques to advance yourself and anything you decide to do in life. I am your host, Dom Brinkman, and every Thursday, I will interview authors, especially self-published ones from various walks of life, who will deliver you information and inspiration to help you charge forward. On a quick side note, be sure to check out my book, Going North, on Amazon.com. It's available on ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Going North podcast, we have, you guessed it, another author, but not just any author. I get the honor to interview an Army veteran who also worked as a corporate professional for 13 years before transitioning to state government. This wonderful lady right here, she earned herself a bachelor's degree in social science from the University of Alabama a master's in forensic psychology and she is also the self-published author of two books one is titled peeling back the layers of your life a pathway to revealing 365 hidden treasures and peeling back the layers of your life inspiring quotes to live by and she's also the founder of her own company Inner Peace Creations, a business that provides training and speaking services to an array of organizations. And you're probably wondering who this special person is. I'm talking about the one, the only, LaRonda C. Giddens. How are you today, ma'am? I am fantastic, sir. How are you this evening? Oh, doing great indeed. Doing great. So, gave a short little introduction of. The wonderful LaRonda, but I'm pretty sure I missed a lot of things. So am I filling in the cavities where I may have missed some things? Well, yes, absolutely. But first, I would just like to thank you for having me as a guest on your podcast, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. I greatly appreciate you and your podcast and your listeners. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, in addition to being an Army veteran, worked for corporate sector for about 13 years, before transitioning to state government, and, you know, I always had the love for psychology when I was in high school. That was my first love. Psychology was my first love. But, you know, as you kind of go through life, you listen to your parents, and, you know, all through high school, my mom was saying, you know, you're never going to make any money in the field of psychology, so you better go into business, start studying some business courses. So that's what I did the first year out of high school. I enrolled in college and was studying business courses, business law and accounting, and it just didn't speak to me the way psychology did. And you know, I went to the Army, and then I came back, got into the business world, and did that, like I said, for about 13 years. But internally, I just felt something calling me. Something was still calling me. I didn't know what that thing was. And I just, at one point, I said, you know what, I've got to follow my heart and do what I really want to do with my life. So I ended up coming to Atlanta on a business trip while I was still working in corporate, and I really loved it here. I've been in Atlanta for 20 years now. Actually, this this year, 2018, is celebrating my 20th year in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I came here, like I said, on a business trip, and I said to myself, you know what, I really want to live in this place. I didn't know anyone here, and I just decided I'm just going to move here. And, you know, life happened, and I was able to get a job in the same field that I was working in, in corporate and financial services, found a job, and came here, and kind of the rest is history. And the way that I was able to transition from corporate, I started volunteering at a uh, organization called Devro, and it's a organization that works with kids who have serious mental illnesses. And I would go out to the campus and play cards with the kids, and play tennis, and do different things like that, just to kind of fill my time and to kind of give back to the community. And that just turned into a job opportunity. While I was still working in corporate, I didn't really need another job, but they offered me a job, and I said, well, maybe this is my way of you know, transitioning back into the field of psychology, which I love. And, you know, I started taking classes at the University of Alabama, 
got my degree in social science and found a degree program, master's program at Argosy University. And it just, you know, the rest is history pretty much. You know, one thing just led to another. And, you know, as I look back on my life, I can kind of see the steps that led me up to the point where I am today. I'm pretty excited about that. Awesome indeed. It's it's really great that you really set out to get that degree in psychology and then <laughs> listen to the parents only to find your way back into using those skills, which is really awesome. <laughs> really awesome. Absolutely. Indeed. Absolutely. Also a veteran in the Army, so how many years did you spend in service? I was I did three years. I was stationed in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. That's where I originally did my training. And then I was stationed in Germany. I stayed in Germany for about roughly two and a half years and then came back to the States. And it's interesting because during that time, I was 19 years old when I went to the Army. So I never really thought about the, the real implications as I stood there with my hand swearing in, saying that I would protect the United States. I never really thought about the seriousness of that at the age of 19 years old. So when I was there, I was stationed on a nuclear weapons site. And for about the first three or four months, I couldn't tell my parents exactly where I was located. So that was kind of interesting. And, and you know, I had a uh, secret security clearance. And, you know, I was there for, like I said, about two and a half years. And it was an amazing experience because I got a chance to travel all over Europe. And it was just really wonderful. But as I look back at it now, just the seriousness of what I was doing and where I was located, I just didn't see it when I was in it. It was, it was just real interesting to know. And to think about that now, I just didn't think about it. I didn't. I never thought about the possibility that we could go to war. And I know that's probably crazy to think about, but at 19 years old, you just don't think about that. Especially being on a nuclear weapons site, we were the first ones out. We would have been the first ones out had we gone to war. And probably maybe three years after I came back home, after I was I left the army, Desert Storm hit. And had I still been in the military, I would have been in war. And I just, you know, like I said, I, it's just surreal to even think about at this point. But I really enjoyed my experience at the, with the military. Amazing indeed. Thank you once again for your service. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's right. It's, it's great when you got service folks that go in and can live to tell the tale and you dodged a bullet with the desert storm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Well, dodge the bullet from Desert Storm and celebrating 20 years in the land of the peaches, Georgia, all the way to publishing two books. What led to the two books, especially the title? Okay, well, let me just say this. Just before we got on the call, I just <laughs> sent another book to be published as well. So that should be coming out in the next couple of days. Woohoo! But the title itself, Peeling Back the Layers of Your Life, just before I left corporate in 2001, I was sitting at my desk and something said to me on a yellow sticky note, write six arrows in an ascending position. Hmm. So I did that and something said, just keep that piece of paper. I didn't know what the piece of paper meant and I would, you know, I'd come to work every day and I would look at that piece of paper and something about it just spoke to me. So I kept it for probably about a good maybe year and a half before I even knew what it meant. Basically, what it evolved, that, that yellow sticky paper, how that evolved from the yellow sticky paper to peeling back the layers of your life. And it's really a, that yellow sticky paper, to me, represents transformation of life. So if you look at the, the very first arrow, and if you think about life, you think about, you know, when a baby is born and they first, you know, before they can start walking, they kind of crawl around. You know, they're, they're crawling. So that, that was the first arrow. And then the second arrow is, you know, you have to stand before you can walk and before you can run, before you can fly, before you can soar. So that's what those arrows represented. It represented its transformation of life for me. And I'm going to go in my room right now and take a look at that so I can explain that a little bit more to where it really makes sense. But that's what that, those six arrows, I'm looking at it now. And the way that I, I did that was transformation of life, peeling back the layers of your life. You have to crawl before you can stand. 
You stand before you can walk, before you can run, fly, and soar. And when you're at a place where you're soaring, to me, that represents you are at a place in your life where you know your purpose, you know what you want to do with your life, but in between those stages, before you can get to the point of soaring, there's a stage, there's an evolution, there's a development process that you have to go through before you can even get to that point. So between the spaces of crawling and standing, you have to be open. Before you can get to the place of standing and walking, you've got to be receptive. Before you can run, you've got to be able to take action. Before you can fly, you've got to have the courage and know that you can fly. And then before you can soar, you have to have faith. You have to have faith in yourself and believe that you can achieve whatever you want. So let's go back to the baby crawling, crawling around in awareness. It's my belief that before I was born, in my mother's womb, God spoke to me, and God told me exactly what he wanted me to do before I came to this planet. Now, some kids, when they pop out of the womb, they know exactly what they want to do, and they get right to the business of doing what their life purpose is. But some of us, we get covered up in layers, and to me, layers represent things like shame and guilt and procrastination and fear, mommy issues, daddy issues, money issues, you know, covered up in other people's expectations. And at some point in your life, you may get those moments, if you're paying attention enough to life, and it'll give you clues to say, okay, well, there's something else that I'm supposed to be doing with my life. But before you can get to finding out what your purpose is, you've got to start peeling those layers. You've got to peel off those layers of fear. You've got to peel, mm -hmm. peel off that layer of procrastination. It's like an onion, but when you, if you look at an onion, what's at the core of an onion? If you get to the, the core of an onion, it looks like a small little bulb, right? Right. And that bulb, to me, represents the womb. That's getting you back to that authentic place that you were born to be. So the whole peeling back the layers of your life concept, to me, is just simply peeling off all of those things that aren't you. And I, I look at the, the statue of David, Michelangelo. He had this saying where David was always there in the marble. The only thing I did was just took away everything that wasn't David thought that was amazing because when I was in, in the Army, I went to the Louvre Museum and I was able to stand there and look at the Statue of David at 19 years old. But I didn't know at that time that I was beginning the journey of peeling back the layers of my own life. That's kind of what the whole peeling back the layers concept is for me. And it's just, it's just a very uh, powerful representation of us having the ability to transform our lives into really finding out what our purpose is and what we're supposed to be doing here. We all have a purpose. We all have something that we're supposed to do. And what we're supposed to do, to me, I believe, it contributes to the overall contribution to the world. We have a contribution to give back to the world. We owe the world something. I feel like I owe the world something for my life. There's something that I was ordained to do and destined to do. And a lot of people, unfortunately, will never know that. They just won't ever know what they came here to do. That is amazing. That is amazing. That that God given design right there with peeling back the layers of the onion and the six different points. <laughs> mhm. Mm yeah, funny enough, I was actually recording another podcast interview this morning, and she mentioned how procrastination is a form of fear, which is actually true when you think about it. So, mm -hmm. funny enough, you mentioned procrastination too. It was like, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and it's no coincidence that you had that conversation with her this morning, and now tonight we're talking about procrastination and fear. It's just, you know, it's, it's, they're barriers. All these things are barriers that are standing in the way of you getting to your next level of greatness. And I feel that if people spent more time and were more aware of what was going on, they could very easily get to that point. I mean, it's hard work. You know, when you're doing that self-work and constantly – trying to be the best person that you can be, which is my goal. And I'll never say that I'm ever at a point where I'm done because there's always, you know, we're always a work in progress. But you have to do the self-work. You have to do that. Yeah, very true indeed. And it and it's really hard to really try to keep up with the self-work. It takes a lot of discipline for that. So any suggestions for those who are looking to really – increase their level of discipline to get the results that they want out of life? To be honest with you, you just have to do it. You have to make a decision. That's what you want to do, and you just have to commit yourself to it. I can look at it now and, and see it plain 
and simple. I've always been the type of person to be very disciplined. You know, a lot of times people aren't that way, but it's something that you can learn. It's something that you can train yourself to be. And if you want it bad enough, then you'll seek the tools that you need in order to structure yourself in a way to get your goals accomplished. It's just something you have to do. If you want it bad enough, then you'll you'll make the sacrifices to make it happen. Amen, indeed. It, it's really true, though. you got to want as bad as you want to breathe, like Eric Thomas says a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, because if it was easy, everybody would. If it was easy, whatever definition of success that you, however you define it, if it was that easy, then everybody would, would have it. Yeah, it's true indeed. Lamborghinis would need to actually have commercials for their cars because everybody would be driving Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hondas probably wouldn't even be best-selling cars anymore, huh? <laughs> right, exactly. Probably would be worth driving. <laughs> That's right. Everybody would have eight-pack abs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It was that easy, then everybody can have it. It's like, like, yep, no more self help. You, all your motivational speakers are done. We already got what we yeah. want. <laughs> yeah, we're good now. We, we need to go find something else to do with ourselves. It's like, yeah, so now we're in the demotivation business. All right, you have too much, everybody. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to put us out of business. <laughs> So with all of your magical experience, what trials did you have to overcome to get to where you currently are today? Uh, Wow. When I was in, now I told you in high school, high school psychology was my love. That was my first love. Fast forward to 2012 when I finally got to the point where I was enrolled in my graduate studies in 2010 and I was studying forensic psychology. My final year of graduate school, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh. April of 2012, diagnosed with breast cancer. Dang. December 2012 was graduation date. Now, between April 2012 and December 2012, I had four research papers I had to do. I had two major presentations I had to do. And two major exams, I mean, two major um, surgeries that I went through between April 2012 and December 2012. Now, when I went to my uh, program chair and told him what was going on, he said, well, LaRonda, you can, you can wait until May of 2013. We can push your graduation back, you know, six months. And I said, there's absolutely no way in the world that I'm going to push back my graduation. This is something that I've wanted my entire life to be able to walk across the stage and to receive my degree in psychology. I said, there's no way. So literally when I tell you I push through all of that in order to graduate in December 2012, it was a major push. It was a major push. But I'm the type of person that, if there's an obstacle in front of me, I'm going to push until it's moved. Amen. And that's just what I did. And that's, you know, that's how I got through it. I had to push through it. I had to pray through it. I just I just kept moving. I didn't stop it. I didn't allow myself to, you know, get into the mode of the why me and um, feeling sorry for myself. I, I didn't. You know, immediately I said to the doctor, okay, well, what do we need to do? You know, how can we get to the other side of it. And that's what I kept telling my mom. I said, I can't wait to get to the other side of this because I know on the other side, there's something greater waiting for me. And I just pushed through. That's a testimony to the power of God right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 2012 was one heck of a year for people. Oh my goodness. Like getting, yeah. getting breast cancer. Oh my goodness. And And the crazy part is, Breast cancer didn't run in my family. No. Oh. It didn't run in my family. You just deal with it. You just I, I like to deal with problems head on. I don't like to. And well, I think what's even crazier, I, I knew someone at the time who, when I was diagnosed, she felt a lump in her breast. And I didn't feel a lump or anything. I, I went and I was getting my mammograms regularly. So, ladies, if you all are listening, please 
get your mammograms. And if you get your mammograms and the doctor finds something, please follow up. African-American women die at a higher rate than Caucasian women, even though Caucasian women are diagnosed at a higher rate. But we die at a higher rate because we don't follow up with our treatments. We don't follow up with doctors' treatments. We just, you know, and I, there was another woman that I knew who went and she had her mammogram and they wanted her to come back and follow up. And she was too afraid to go back to see what the doctor wanted to tell her. They would send her registered letters. And it had been a year later and she just wouldn't do it because she was too afraid. Being fearful is not going to stop what's happening in your body. So you have to, if you get diagnosed, you have to have the courage to get whatever treatment is necessary to save your life because that's what we're here to do is save lives. We're not here to lose lives. We want to save people's lives. So get those mammograms. It's really important. Amen, indeed, because your situation will just probably get even worse if you're fearful about it because then your body Absolutely. just reacts to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is awesome, too, because you're the second guest on this podcast that overcame breast cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah, guest in the early episodes, uh, late name is Gladys Peaches Kenny. Her, funny enough, it took her six years to write her first book, and right before she was about to have her book event, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah, so imagine that, right? It's like it's like you you're about to graduate, and then your breast cancer, you're right? Your book is finally mm-hmm. done after all these years, and then you're about mm-hmm. to launch the event, your friends, and boom, you're diagnosed with it, and you have to go to surgery. It's like, oh, dang! Absolutely, absolutely. But the one thing I will tell you about breast cancer for me, it did two things for me, because I felt like I was slowly dying, and I felt like breast cancer saved my life. Wow. And six months after. My diagnosis. So keep in mind that from April 2012 to December 2012, the only thing I was doing was pushing. I wasn't processing mentally what was happening to me. And it wasn't until I went to a women's retreat, May of 2013 is when I, I completely just literally fell apart because I had not had, because I had a bilateral mastectomy. I could have had a mastec, a, a, a lumpectomy where they went in and just removed the cancerous cells, but my thinking was I don't want to have to go to the doctor's office for the rest of my life getting checked and, and all these different things. So I elected to have a bilateral mastectomy where they remove the breast tissue from both both breasts. And I had not grieved the loss of that breast, those breast tissue. I just didn't. And when I was sitting in that woman's retreat that day, literally, I just that was the moment it all just kind of hit me that, wow, This is something serious that happened, and I had not mentally processed any of that. But out of that, I was able to, in May of 2013, in the year of 2013, is when I rediscovered what my purpose is on this planet. I remembered that conversation that God had with me when I was in my mother's womb. And I asked God, what is it that you want me to do when I come to this planet? And he said to me, LaRonda, you are a teacher, you are a healer, you are a life changer, and I want you to use your words to elevate the consciousness of humanity. That's what God told me in my mother's womb. And that's what I've been doing since 2013, using my words to elevate the consciousness of humanity by writing books and quotes and different things to uplift people and to give them hope that their life doesn't have to be what it is today. You can change your life. You can change it, but it's going to require hard work, but it's possible. That's what I want to give people hope, that whatever they want to do, they can change it. Your life doesn't have to be the same always. Amen, indeed. Yeah, it's really good that you're raising consciousness. That's really a word you're hearing a lot today about the woke movement, but sometimes being awake from those folks isn't good, but we got... They're good folks like you were trying to wake people up in a good way and realizing that they have gifts from above that they can use to help others in the way that God wants them to help others. <laughs> Absolutely. So with all of your knowledge and trials you had to overcome, has there been any, been any other books in addition to the Bible that have really encouraged you to really keep it moving? Well, 
years ago in my early 20s, I read a book by James Redfield called The Celestine Prophecy. And when I tell you that book changed my life, because just the, the premise of the book basically just talked about there are no coincidences in life and to look for the signs and the messages that are out there. I mean, it's, it's literally plain and simple all around us. People are so consumed with things that are distracting them that they don't really take time to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. And life is not a huge mystery. It's not rocket science. Everything you need to know resides within you. But you have to take that time to figure out what it is. So basically what James Redfield was saying is, like even with this conversation, and when I when I meet people, either there's going to be an exchange, either I have a, a delivery, a message for someone, or they have a message for me, or maybe I just have a message for them, or maybe they just have a message for me. And I think after I read that book, I felt like, wow, my antennas are up. Every time I meet someone, I'm looking for the message or the lesson in this exchange between you know, myself and this other person, however long that person's in my life, whether it's you know, a person I pass on the street or someone who's in my life for a long period of time, what am I supposed to be learning from this person or what lesson am I supposed to be giving? And that was kind of the premise of the book, and it really changed my life. And another one that was really great was Who Moved My Cheese? And I can't remember the name of the author. I I think it's Spencer something. Yep, Spencer Johnson. Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, Spencer Johnson. And he, you know, talked about change, and I I think it's very important for people to understand that things are going to change and a lot of people resist change but you know in my early 20s again that was a a critical kind of time for me of just of learning as I look back on that just understanding that things aren't always going to be the same and you have to be okay with that you have to be okay with the fact that things are changing and change is good a lot of times change is good because if I were the same person I was 20 years ago I would we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now so I think it's very important for us to, to to have that growth mindset to constantly evolve and change and to the best person that we could possibly be and to tap into those those skills and those gifts and those natural abilities that we have. It's, you know, it's amazing sometimes I'll ask people, what does your best life look like? And to me it's a pretty simple question, but the answers that I get, usually I don't get a response at all because people don't know. They don't know what their best life looks like. And that just, I'm just amazed by that. So then we start to dig a little bit deeper and, you know, try to figure out, well, what type of things did you like to do when you were a kid? Just to kind of, you know, bring some type of visualization to it to say, well, if you can't really see what your best life looks like, well, let's, let's kind of look around. Let's see what's, what's kind of out there in the universe and say, well, well, maybe this is something I want to do or maybe that's something I want to do. But I think people can't see it because they can't really see how it's going to happen. They can't see how every day I'm driving to work to this 9 to 5, but I really want to be on a private jet flying around the world, giving people hope and inspiring people to live their best life, which is my vision for myself. So every single day I go to work, I'm driving to work. I drive on 285, and every day that I'm driving on 285, I say to myself, I'm going from 285 today and Tomorrow I'll be on a private jet flying around the world, encouraging people, inspiring people to live their best life. That's what I say to myself every single day. So you have to be able to see just a glimmer. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't even care how it's going to happen. The only thing that's important is I believe in myself enough to know that it's going to happen. That's all I need. Amen, indeed. And it's really true about folks knowing what the perfect life is it kind of goes back to a variation of that question of describing your perfect day just write it down it's it's like (laughs) Mm -hmm. my my perfect day uh let's see in the bed bonbons tv (laughs) the walking dead binge (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) but you've got to you've got to be able to see something you've got to Visualize something. Yeah, it's true indeed because, uh, heck, that, that even reminds me of Dennis Kimbrough where he talks about how a lot Love of things him. in the world, they usually have two forms of creation where it's first the inner and the outer. It starts in the mind. Someone had to actually visualize mm-hmm. it. 
like you said, absolutely. And then it actually manifests later. It's it, it's really powerful. Absolutely. But I think we just get so caught up in how is it going to happen. That's what stops most people because they can't conceivably see how this thing that I'm dreaming of and visualizing and uh, fantasizing about my best life, this is what it looks like, but I don't see how I'm capable of making that happen. They can, and that's what stops them because they're just like, I, I can't see it, so I guess I'm not going to be able to do that. I guess I can't have this best life because I don't see the steps that I need to take in order for it to happen. And, you know, my suggestion is take a first step. Do something. You've got to do something. You can't just sit and wait for it to happen because if you sit and wait around for it, it's never going to happen. Amen, indeed. <laughs> you can sit, hope, wish, and pray, but until you take action, it's not going to happen, right? Absolutely. Well, with all of your knowledge and experience that you've gained, if you could take all of that knowledge and keep all of it and be 25 in 2018, what advice would you give to yourself? Don't ever stop dreaming. Never stop believing. Just don't stop. Even when you have no evidence of what you want your life to be, you still have to take action. You still have to keep moving. You have to keep pushing yourself forward. And it's interesting because I told myself earlier this week, you've got to push yourself harder. You've got to work harder. And I, I feel like I'm a pretty hard worker and pretty pretty disciplined, but I feel sometimes you have to push yourself a little bit further beyond your comfort zone. So I definitely would tell my 25-year-old self, just don't ever stop dreaming. Always see the vision and always believe in yourself and know that you can do and accomplish anything that you want to. You just have to keep moving. That's right. Can't stop, won't stop. Keep on moving. That's right. Well, all right, for those who want to keep in good contact with you, where can we keep in touch with the wonderful LaRonda? Well, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at Inspired2, the number two, Peel. That's Inspired2 Peel on all social media. And you can also find me on my website at LaRondaCGiddens.com. That's L-O-R-O-N-D-A-C-G-I-D-D-E-N-S. Dot com, And if you'd like to email me, it's also inspired, I-N-S-P-I-R-E-D, the number two, P-E-E-L, at gmail.com. I welcome your questions, comments, inquiries. I look forward to hearing from you all very soon. And I'd just like to thank you, Dom, for having me today. I really appreciate you, your kindness. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure indeed. I'm looking forward to book number three, especially after I purchase one of the first two books, too. Especially the quote book. I'm, I love quotes. Excellent. Well, that's the, that was the third one that I just published in the quotes book. This is 143 quotes to live by. Of course, it's peeling back the layers of your life. And I've got three others that I'm currently working on, too. Constantly writing and trying to push the brand forward and elevate consciousness. There you go, Elevate Consciousness. Elevated beyond shea butter. I love it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a bunch for your listening ears on the Going North Podcast. I hope you really, really enjoyed that episode. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to share it with your friends and family, especially those who love podcasts and love listening to some inspiration and motivation. And keep a lookout for... The sequel to Going North Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself in October 2018. And if you'd like to connect with me directly, feel free to shoot me an email at dombraidman at gmail.com. 